Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, dans mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, dans mon jardin d'hiver. It's hard to believe how many different stories we're tracking tonight because we are now just days away from a historic impeachment probe vote. Democrats eyeing new avenues, including possible corruption. The reports here are about how Trump is using the presidency to line his own pockets with your money. From Vice President Pence's very odd stay at Trump's Island Resort to AG Barr dropping 30K at a Trump hotel. And now it's reporting that military personnel have been staying at Trump properties, raising eyebrows. Now the powerful Democratic House Oversight Committee is pushing the Pentagon, threatening a new subpoena to get into the details of what was going on on these stays. This comes after Politico's Natasha Bertrand reported that Air Force crews stayed at Trump's Turnberry Resort at least four times since 2018. Meanwhile, a nearby airport was arranging for transportation to the resort and packing lunches for crew members. All of this factors into the impeachment probe vote this week. It's a president who is profiting, has turned the White House into a profit-making machine, um, directing people to stay at his resorts. And I think we have to do what the framers gave us the power to do. And if we don't, we actually are undermining the Constitution. Trump's allies say whatever the appearances here, nothing has broken the law, they claim. Some might say this also appears at times like small ball. You have a couple thousand dollars in some of these accountings. But look at it like this. Not only is this your money, which you might care how it's spent, but the appearance of impropriety can be quite a bad look, particularly when you recall the larger context. It was Donald Trump's campaign manager brought down on corruption charges, garden variety, pocket lining. And as these questions are circling, Trump has promised answers. I own a lot of different places. Soon you'll find that out when I because I'll be at some point prior to the election. I'm going to be given out a financial report of me and it'll be extremely complete. We turn out to Barrett Berger, former federal prosecutor and MSNBC legal analyst. Uh, nice to see you. Nice to see you. How about the point that while nobody wants taxpayer dollars misspent, uh, there is a question of is this the right thing for Democrats to focus on in scale or does it actually echo the history of a lot of corruption cases, which is sometimes it starts small. Yeah, I think it's the latter. I mean, this really is sort of garden variety corruption. I mean, what we have here is essentially a violation of the Constitution's emoluments clause, which is a very legalistic way of saying the, the founders of the Constitution wanted to protect situations of undue influence on the president, but also from the president profiting from holding public office, right? So that means the president is not allowed to accept any money. He's not allowed to profit in any way other than his set salary. Not a penny over. So whether some people say, oh, this is really de minimis, it's only a few thousand dollars here or there, that really doesn't make a difference when you look at the heart of it. The president is simply not allowed, while holding public office under our Constitution, to profit from this office. And what we've seen is really a pattern of various emoluments violations, really starting from the minute he took office. And even if someone is inclined to say, well, I want to give my president the benefit of the doubt, isn't the whole problem with a conflict it, that it doesn't assume you are ethically challenged, you may be, it assumes that 
we don't want people in positions of authority, whether they're deciding on an execution or a bombing or anything else, to choose between their self-interest and the public interest. Yeah, that's exactly right. You're sort of saying, we're not even going to put you in a position where you could make the wrong decision. It's this appearance of impropriety. We want to make sure that we're guarding against that. I mean, I think the, the root of the issue here, though, is because you have a president who really historically did not divest himself from his businesses, that's really the root of a lot of these problems here when you look at sort of these emoluments violations because he still has these conflicts exactly like you said he didn't take himself away he didn't put it in a blind trust he still has you know access to this these businesses so you have these conflicts that are really just ripe for saying that there's something fishy going on uh, my last question for you is is the hardest okay. uh, federal prosecutors as you know love to stack up their counts you know supersize it and then maybe you get a deal back is that how the Democrats, if they want to go on impeachment, should approach this? Or do you think they need to focus? I think they need to focus really for a, a matter of timeliness here. I mean, if they want to look at every possible instance of wrongdoing, every obstructive act, every emoluments violation, every potential you know, act of, that was improper, they're going to be doing this for the next five years. So I think they really have to focus on what they can get done in a short period of time and really try to play their best hand first. It is Wednesday, the 11th of September of 2019, and you are in West Coast Cookbook at Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam, and our daily special is Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. Will no one rid us of this priest? Well, on the 18th anniversary of 2019, the President of the United States, rather than honor the day, the people who died... And those who responded so bravely, rather than honor that, he has a list of grievances that have been directed at him, <laughs> because it's always about him. And his people will defend him to the umpteenth degree. Oh my God, I can't believe these people. And now they're going around saying that we Democrats never believe that 9-11 happened. Oh, yeah, they qualify it with, well, not the way it really happened. And how did it really happen? Some sort of 9-11 truther thing that you believe in? All right. Well, it's all a disinformation campaign from their side. They don't care if the, burn, if the world burns to a crisp as long as they are the ones holding marshmallows and can kick the lips. It's all about owning the libs. No, it's not all about owning the libs. <laughs> because there's a tremendous amount of economic anxiety there, and we know what that means. Uh-huh. It, it is also quite amazing how in the fever swamps of the right wing right now, not one word about any of the malfeasance and illegalities of this president, but they're going to bring up fever swamp conspiracy theories about how Obama was the real criminal. <laughs> Fast and Furious. Remember that one? Yeah. Fast and Furious started during the GW administration, but somehow it got saddled onto Obama because he's black. And as soon as you say that, the the ones that were out there saying, Oh, bummer, he, didn't, he wasn't born in America. He's not an American. Chicago thug. <laughs> as soon as you start talking about the racial animosity that's been directed at the black president, they are all up in arms about how racist we are because we keep bringing up race. All right. You got the racist president in chief. And I put quotation marks around president because that's how we do it here at Netroots Radio, according to the Netroots Radio style manual. You have that racist in chief. And uh, no one believes that any of the systemic racism that has occurred in the United States was ever racism. What about slavery? Oh, that was so long ago. At the same time, they uh, will argue that unions are thugs. And the CEOs should be able to do what they want. You mean make people work for nothing like a slave? <laughs> yeah, talk about plantation mentality. That's right. The argument from the libertarian side is that 
A contract's a contract. So, uh, uh, people should be able to negotiate a contract to work for nothing. That should be their right. That is their argument. Let's negotiate a contract so that I don't get paid. And that contract will be perfectly uh, uh, enforced. All right. Well, that's not working for nothing. That's called slavery. <laughs> okay. And then they'll say, yeah, but it's not about race. You just wait. You just wait. See what the workforce looks like if we have contracts where people can uh, sign on the dotted line to work for nothing. Okay. I see where this is going. Because what's next? Oh, yeah. Trump wants to put homeless people in California into concentration camps. <laughs> the federal government is going to go in the states and take over. I wonder what that's called. What is that called? You know, it's quite amazing. Everything, absolutely everything that they are afraid that the violent left will do, they do. It's absolute projection. <laughs> because they figure if they're doing it, everybody is. Because they're good people. And if they're good people doing this, what are the bad people doing? I... I've seen this behavior for quite a while now. It's almost as if it is a determinant. Quite amazing. <laughs> so, so you got Trump doing that. You got, you got John Bolton quitting. Oh, and now they're in an argument about, about whether he quit or he was fired. Who cares? John Bolton. Oh, oh, that's another thing. John Bolton is now a progressive, according to Tucker Carlson. He's a hero of the left, according to Tucker Carlson. Talk about disinformation, John Bolton, that war criminal who we have been trying to get arrested and uh, frog marched to The Hague. He's now our hero. Oh, God. And Tucker Carlson is goose stepping right in step. Because he's paid to do it. Oh, can you tell that I'm quite angry? Yes, I am. Oh, on a personal front here in the local arena, boy, boy, when you can't win an argument on anything, let's go for ageism. Oh, jeez. I thought people would be more enlightened than that, but apparently not. Uh, maybe it's because I grew up in a household who had an academic who wrote treatises on old age politics and senior citizen rights that I learned at an early age that, you know, ageism is uh, just as bad as any other kind of discrimination. And maybe we should not use language that uh, promotes ageism, even on an unconscious level, because that's the worst and most insidious kind now, isn't it? When it's unconscious. And I know that there's a, you know, there's a dynamic that if you are raised up in a particular kind of belief, you, you, you kind of think that's normal and everybody's doing it. And so it was quite a shock when I found out that even my progressive friends were really ageist when we were younger. All oh, the old people, they don't know anything. Yeah. Wait until you get old and see what it sounds like. <laughs> so I tried to avoid that. I wouldn't say, just as an aside, that Robert Frost was my favorite poet. I like blank verse. It's fine. Uh, but he did have a quote about how he never dared be radical when young for fear he would turn conservative when old. Boy, isn't that a truism. All those boomers I was growing up with, I thought we were, uh, you know, trying to uh, uh, disrupt the positive paradigm. I had no idea that disrupting the positive paradigm would lead to uh, becoming even more hyper-conservative and racist than the generations before. How did that happen? I'll tell you how that happened, because that youth movement everybody talked about back in the day was really quite small. You may have been young, but that didn't necessarily mean that you were part of this big block. Because there were many more that were promoting 
uh, and and uh, uh, advocating the war in Vietnam. It really wasn't a whole lot of people that started that movement. And the only reason, just to sum up here, the only reason Vietnam started is because the great middle of America got tired of their kids dying there. And when they raised their voice, the silent majority was not who Richard Nixon deemed them to be, the law and order bullies. The silent majority was truly the silent majority, that great middle of America who just is hunkered down trying to make ends meet. When they finally lifted up their heads from the toil of their endeavors, they were finally able to think about what the hell has been going on. So, yeah, unions are thugs. Workers should not have any kind of say about their work environment or their lives. They are nothing more than wage slaves. Shut up. Get back to work. Stop thinking. Do not lift your head up. What's on the rest of the menu here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy? Well, at the top. That was a breakdown on how the House Oversight Committee has threatened to subpoena documents from the Pentagon related to military personnel staying at Trump resorts. I still want to know. I still want to know how it was and who it was that brokered some sort of agreement with the military and the Trump Organization in 2015 to land planes at... Uh, uh, I keep saying Prescott. It's pick, pick squeak, <laughs> pick squeak. No, not pick squeak. I'll get it down. The little airport that was struggling next to Turnberry. 2015. How does that happen? I know that Flynn was working in the military then and having a lot of problems uh, with Obama. Is this part of all of that? You know, he was, uh, you know, uh, ousted also for misappropriating funds. Wasn't for just being a crazy ass right wing conspiracy nut. It wasn't just that. On the rest of the menu in the Bistro Cafe, 37 businesses and counting tell customers to stop carrying guns in their stores. I want to see the sign. No shirt, no shoes, no sir, no shirt, no shoes, no skateboards, no bikes, and no guns. What? If you have no shirt or no shoes, does that mean that you're not supposed to wear a shirt or shoes? If you don't have guns, oof. You know what? We're going to tighten up that sign so it makes a lot more sense. But I like the idea of no more guns because I got to tell you. I really do hate taking my elderly mom to the store and seeing these ammo sexuals with their guns because they're so afraid they're going to be confronted and they need a gun to be able to get through the day. I am glad that they are being discouraged. Oh, they're going to get mad. They're, they're, they're worse than smokers. And I, 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 I look, I mean, when you're 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 getting off the nicotine you get pretty agitated and and when you're really invested in the smoking aspect of life you don't want anyone taking it away from you and any mention of it really gets smokers quite upset gun nuts are worse i don't know what what is the in addictive ingredient i wonder what it is a GOP congressman claimed Trump's record deficit is somehow Nancy Pelosi's fault. Yeah, she's been in on the job for eight months. <laughs> Has to fight uh, a Senate that does nothing. Will not even discuss a bill uh, sent to them from the House. And we already know what the White House is. But somehow, it's Nancy's fault. I'll tell you why it's Nancy's fault. Because she's there. And Giuliani's attempt to pressure the Ukraine to dig up dirt on Trump's challengers triggers several congressional probes. Couldn't have happened to a more loathsome cretin. 
After the break, we then moved to the chef's table, where Japanese utility TEPCO said it has not been able to restore electricity to about 400,000 homes after outages caused by Typhoon Faxe. And both Republican and Democratic senators said they expected Congress would restore the $250 million in military aid for the Ukraine. If Trump goes ahead with his plans to block the assistance. All that and more. On West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Bon Appetit. Bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com to the rightish of the page, right there by the social media scroll, definitely located because of superior graphic design, is our chat room link monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. To the leftish of the page from the chat room link at the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com. Dot com is our Patreon link, definitely located by Superior Graphic Design as well. Thank you, Tom. And uh, if you could, all quit kidding aside now, if you could please become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio, you know, three, five, seven dollars, you know, the, the, the cost of a espresso type coffee drink once a month directed our way goes a long way for us being able to pay the bills and accumulate those funds to get newish machinery since this machinery has been working like uh well a workhorse workhorses for all these many years eight to be exact eight years and counting and uh uh your generosity has allowed us to do that and uh, we still require it i actually have a a dell that's running on windows 7 it's a workhorse indeed well they're gonna they being uh Microsoft is going to stop supporting Windows 7. And this this machine is is really quite old, so we need to pick up another one. And we thank you for your generosity in allowing us to save for that. Thank you. Follow Netroots Radio on Twitter at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that, and we thank Tom also for doing that. Follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam, and I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime, a very integral part to this multimedia operation, which we call West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. All the notes and all the links are there, and uh, we had a little bit of flavor here, but uh, you'll need to see what the original recipe stated, wouldn't you? Yes, you would. Follow uh, the show on Twitter at Cookbook West and pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, and wherever podcasts can be found. This first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Smothered Benedict Wednesdays, is by Josh Israel out of Share Blue Media. Two more major grocery retailers announced that they would ask customers not to openly carry guns while shopping in their stores. Discount supermarket chain Aldi announced that it would ask that customers refrain from openly displaying firearms in any of our stores except for authorized law enforcement personnel. And the grocery chain Major said that it would respectfully request the same. And they have to say respectfully because these people have guns. And they're mad as hell, and they're not going to take it anymore. You think fences make good neighbors? This gun's going to make sure you're polite, or else. Wow, how neighborly. These companies are the latest in a rapidly growing list of businesses responding to a push by gun violence prevention group Moms Demand Action to get guns out of retail stores. 
two of the dozens of mass shootings last month took place in Walmart stores, including the tragic El Paso shooting. At the urging of Bombs Demand Action and, and others, the company changed its policy on open carry and announced it would reduce its sales of ammunition. I'll jump in and say there was a bit of a de debate locally here on Facebook message boards about the uh, the leftist fascists walking all over the Constitution and taking their Second Amendment rights away to be able to kill people with wanton abandon. How dare those mothers say, I can't do that. So uh, I, I suspect that there's going to be a bit of uh, flaunting. Now, the other aspect that I, you know, if you talk about putting a safety on a gun, the first argument that comes out of their mouths, I, you, you check it up, it, 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 check it out. It's, it's anecdotal, I, I agree. But it's been happening so frequently. I think it's the norm. As soon as you say something simple about any kind of small, minuscule aspect of gun safety, like how about a safety on a gun that would prevent a kid from shooting it? The first thing that they come that they come with their argument is that you're trying to take my guns away. You're taking all my guns away. So when this open carry request was issued by these stores saying, please don't be open carrying. What was the argument? They can't take my concealed permit away. Well, no one was talking about your concealed permit. And I would think it's pretty stupid to tell people you have, you, you, you're concealing a gun. I mean, it defeats the purpose of concealing a gun now, doesn't it? The only reason people open carry is because they want to show off how much of a bully they are, while at the same time being abjectly uh, and ultimate cowards. Abject and ultimate cowards. I'll get it out! <sighs> people who carry concealed weapons actually have to go through a process to get that permit. I'm not a big fan of guns, but I do understand when people need to have a concealed permit, I've had friends as elected officials or in other positions in which they could become vulnerable by a bunch of looty to nuts that they were actually approached by law enforcement saying, you need a concealed permit because we can't always be there. Sorry. Now the open carry people take the concealed permit idea to the extreme and say, well, the cops aren't ever going to be there, so I'm going to make sure people know that I can kill with wanton abandon, with all the lead I can muster. And if there's collateral damage, hey, that's the price you got to pay to uphold the Second Amendment of the Constitution. Amen. The National Rifle Association slammed Walmart's decision as a shameful cave and promised that the store lines will soon be replaced by lines and other retailers who are more supportive of America's fundamental freedoms. Well, National Rifle Association, there's a fundamental freedom of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And the pursuit of happiness usually doesn't include bleeding out in a store getting some frozen TV dinners. Do I sound angry? In just the past few weeks, chains including Albertsons, CVS, Wegmans, Walgreens, Walmart, and Kroger have changed their policies and asked customers not to openly carry guns in their stores. Frustrated, some gun rights activists have said they plan to simply ignore Walmart's request and test whether the chain will actually enforce it. You're going to get an elderly greeter out there telling, would you please not bring this gun to the store? The person with the gun decides what kind of polite conversation exists. Not every retailer has responded favorably to mom's demand action requests. Michaels has answered several customers who tweeted urging the company to go gun free with a statement that it follows local and state laws and abide by current regulations in place. Well, you know what? Your plastic and satin cloth flowers aren't worth that much to go in there risking the life of my elderly mom or my grandkids. It's been a rough period for the NRA. 
In recent months, several board members have resigned in an ongoing dispute over the organization's direction. News reports have exposed the group's lavish spending on Chief Executive Wayne LaPierre and ethical questions around board members and former President Marion Hammer. Last week, San Francisco's Board of Supervisors voted to label the group a terrorist organization. Well, yeah, they're also being funded by a hostile foreign power. The group angrily responded with a video featuring rank-and-file members, including a certified pistol instructor for the anti-LGBTQ Trail Life USA, a gunsmith, and a self-described husband, shooter, and wine connoisseur, claiming they were not terrorists. Well, the wine connoisseur is still a terrorist. Next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Smothered Benedict Wednesdays is again brought to us by Josh Israel of ShareBlue Media. The national debt and current budget deficit have both climbed to all-time highs under Trump, but this week, Republicans are suggesting that the real blame for this should fall on Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, who was elected to that position just eight months ago. Representative Jason Smith, repug of Missouri, made the argument on Twitter. Since Speaker Pelosi took control, he argued, the deficit is 20% higher. Our grandkids will have to pay for the government's fiscal irresponsibility. You know, that's funny because I keep telling my grandkids about how they're going to be saddled with the moral irresponsibility of this so-called president for generations to come. And they're going to have a lot of work ahead of them because of it. House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy made a similar argument in a Fox News interview. Asked about Trump's deficits, the California Republican responded, If you watch that, the Republicans were able to do, and what they have control over in the eight years they were in the majority, with discretionary, they spent less than when Nancy Pelosi was speaker the time before. After running on a platform of balancing the budget and prioritizing thrift over extravagance, the Republicans did neither in 2017 and 2018, the two years they controlled all three branches of government. The most significant legislative accomplishment over that time was the passage of Trump's massive tax cut, which benefited mostly very rich and big corporations. Both Smith and McCarthy voted for the bill and even attempted to make the cuts permanent, despite the administration's claims that these tax cuts would magically pay for themselves by spurring massive economic growth. Even the bill's author, Representative Kevin Brady, a repug from Texas, admitted recently that that was basically a lie. Instead, even as Trump has touted their greatest economy ever, Revenue has dropped, fueling larger deficits than at any time in American history. Rather than cut extravagant spending programs like the billions of dollars Trump wants to spend on a border wall, spending has actually increased. The notion that Pelosi is the one to blame for this suggests that Smith does not understand economics or basic civics. The fiscal situation for 2019 is mostly the result of policies passed by the people in power in 2018 and before, when Pelosi and the Democrats were in the minority. Since Pelosi became Speaker in January, Republicans have controlled the Senate and the White House for every single hour, making it impossible for House Democrats to do anything without bipartisan agreement. 
Now, Smith's campaign website brands him as the new generation conservative who knows the hard work it takes each and every day to make ends meet. Well, do the ends justify the means? of Share Blue Media brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Trump's personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani, uh, that personal attorney, not the other one that's supposed to be the AG bar, but this, this personal attorney, is being investigated by three congressional committees for his attempts to contact a foreign government to seek help attacking Trump's Democratic political rivals. The leader of the House Foreign Affairs, Intelligence, and Oversight Committees demanded information from the White House and the State Department regarding Giuliani's contacts with Ukraine and a decision to hit pause on more than $250 million in security assistance already appropriated by Congress. House Foreign Affairs Chair Elliot Engel, House Intelligence Chair Adam Schiff, and House Oversight Committee Elijah Cummings wrote a letter addressed to White House Counsel Pat Cipollone and Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, raising their concerns. Giuliani, according to the letter, appears to have acted outside legitimate law enforcement and diplomatic channels to coerce the Ukrainian government into pursuing two politically motivated investigations. The statement is in reference to reports that Giuliani has been pushing the Ukrainian government to dig up dirt on former VP Joe Biden. The operation is reminiscent of the Trump campaign's contact with Russian operatives during the 2016 election, seeking dirt to attack former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Now, Biden is one of the leading Democratic presidential candidates, and along with several other front runners, has been polling ahead of Trump. This is the problem when you have a hostile foreign power trying to manipulate American politics. They really don't know American politics and civics that intimately. But they can get help. In the letter, Cummings noted that Trump has threatened to withhold over $250 million in security assistance to Ukraine. That was appropriated by Congress. It then states that if Trump is attempting to withhold the money for Ukraine in exchange for aiding Giuliani's crusade, this would represent a staggering abuse of power and a betrayal of the public trust, Cummings wrote. The chairs note that the action would be a boon to Moscow, as Ukraine has been fending off attempts by Russia to increase its influence in the region. The committees are seeking records from the White House and State Department regarding Trump's actions with regard to Giuliani, Ukraine, and related issues. Trump has already demonstrated that he is willing to have federal agencies like NOAA divert themselves from their stated missions to prop up his personal crusades. Congress is now attempting to see if in concert with Giuliani, the State Department has been drawn into the pro-Trump crusade. Show your hands. Show them all. The time has come. Well, let's hope it's just not sternly worded letters and we actually enforce the rule of law. If the only way to wrest these documents or any information out of these scaf laws is through an impeachment inquiry, then so be it. Let them run on their record. Let them vote to uphold and support 
the crimes of Donald Trump. All right, let's get to our break. And when we get back from that break, we are going to go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today, albeit how much time we've burned up. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new Earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. This week, Revenge Down Under. Australian director Jennifer Kent is best known to American audiences for her 2014 debut horror offering, The Babadook. Her sophomore effort, The Nightingale, is arguably scarier because it is based on the very real horrors that occurred in 19th century Australia on the part of the British colonizers. Set in the 1820s on the island of Tasmania, The Nightingale tells the story of Claire, an Irish convict who has served her sentence but is still being held in indentured servitude by a vile lieutenant named Hawkins. When Claire dares to ask for her freedom, she is brutally raped and her husband and baby killed in front of her. Justifiably set on revenge, Claire hires an aboriginal guy, Billy, played by newcomer by Kali Ganimbar, in a stunning debut to track down Hawkins and his men as they journey cross-country to another town. The deep sympathy that the audience feels for Claire evaporates a bit when we see how she treats Billy, who makes it clear he's only doing the job for the money. He's used to being treated with a mixture of hostility hostility and condescension by the settlers, but the horrors he sees during their quest unsettle even him. Eventually, he and Claire both come to realize they're both marginalized people with a common enemy. As the film continues, whether Claire will succeed in her revenge becomes less of a question than how the revenge you know is coming will actually manifest. At times, the Nightingale can be a bit slow-paced, and some of the brutality portrayed is downright uncomfortable. But overall, it is still riveting and sheds light on the fact that the U.S. isn't the only place with a horrible racial past. Add Gannon Barr's performance in the gorgeously captured Australian countryside, and this one shouldn't be missed. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our page on YouTube. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Christopher Intagliata. In 1964, the Beatles set foot in America and kicked off the British invasion. But musical revolutions don't occur only in human culture. They also happen among humpback whales and their songs. Yeah, I mean, it's very much like a, a fashion or a new type of song that maybe comes from a different country and all of a sudden it's number one and everyone wants to listen to it. Claire Owen, a marine scientist at the University of St. Andrews. The number one song she's talking about are the tunes sung by humpback whales in the South Pacific, which Owen's team recorded at half a dozen wintering grounds. Among the recordings, they found several variations on an older theme throughout the region. But they also found a new, more commonly recorded song. Even though that song was new, it had spread rapidly through multiple whale populations, replacing the old tune. In other words, it was a hit. And the key to that rapid spread, Owen says, might be a newly studied hub of cetacean musical exchange, the uninhabited Kermadec Islands, north of New Zealand, where whales from all over the South Pacific converge en route to Antarctica. And the search for songs and their information may be a reason for the convergence. We have whales traveling from the Cook Islands um, and making a huge deviation towards the Kermadec Islands on their southerly migration. And so it's, yeah, certainly opens up that kind of question of why is this so important and what does this learning of the song actually mean to their survival and maybe their reproduction? Maps, details, and links to the full songs are in the journal Royal Society Open Science. Owen's team did catch one whale who was singing a mashup of the older song and the newer hit song, evidence perhaps of it being caught in the act of revising its repertoire, and of the new tune, 
rising to the top of the humpback charts. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Hey, kids and parents, it's back to school time. As you shop for school supplies and get ready for class, make sure you have emergency plans in place. Did you know that emergency preparedness plays a major role in school life? Throughout the year, schools actively prepare for natural disasters, outbreaks, and other emergency situations. Students and parents need to be aware and learn what to do during an emergency. Every family should build an emergency kit, make a family disaster plan, and be informed about events that could affect their community. Parents, take a few extra steps to help children be prepared. Make sure they know the full name, address, and phone numbers of parents or guardians. In our high-tech world of cell phones, memorizing emergency phone numbers is very important. Include a copy of this information in their backpack. Other items to keep in their backpack include water and non-perishable snacks, a pocket-sized first aid kit, a whistle to alert others for help, and a list of allergies, medical conditions, and medications. Make sure their school and teacher have a copy, too. Be familiar with different routes and ways to travel home, like walking, taking the bus, or riding home with another student who lives nearby. Establish a secret code word with your child and whoever takes them home from school to protect against an unauthorized person picking them up. This list is a great starting point to prepare your student for the upcoming school year. Customize these steps to fit your child's capabilities and needs. Ask school administrators and teachers about emergency preparedness plans so you know what steps they are taking to keep your child safe. Many schools have guidelines on how to shelter in place during natural disasters, how to secure classrooms during an emergency lockdown, and how to teach preparedness curriculum to students. Remember, emergency preparedness is important for everyone. Children who are prepared are more confident during stressful emergency situations. By following preparedness guidelines, parents, children, and school staff can improve their safety and peace of mind. For more information on school emergency preparedness, visit cdc.gov slash children slash schools. To learn more about disasters and emergency preparedness, follow at CDC Emergency on Twitter or visit emergency.cdc.gov. So, let's get prepared. Have a great school year. For the most accurate health information, visit www.cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. He seems sorry. We very clearly told him not to look up there. I'm honestly impressed that he was able to do it. Right? What did he balance on that big chair? Yeah, I mean, I guess he'll just know what his gifts are this year. I really thought we had hidden them well. If they can find their presence, they can find a gun. 911, what is your emergency? Every day, eight kids and teens are unintentionally killed or injured by loaded and unlocked guns. Learn how to make your home safer at nfamilyfire.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council and N Family Fire. Hi, I'm Tom Harbin, and since you're listening to NetrootsRadio.com, show your progressive side and go to the Donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power Netroots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our Donate button at the bottom of netrootsradio.com. Thank you for keeping Progressive Radio at full power. It started as a headline, seemingly straight out of The Onion. I'm Baratunde Thurston from The Onion, and also... (laughs) Mother... You're listening to the Civil Liberties Minute with ACLU attorney Bill Newman. So began the front page New York Times article about Donald Trump's demand that he be allowed to buy Greenland. The article then noted that the Greenland misadventure occurred at a particularly fraught time for President Trump, who has just recently, quote, proudly quoted a radio host declaring that Israeli Jews love him as if he were the king of Israel and the second coming of God. And then even more concerning that Mr. Trump accused Jews who vote for Democrats of great disloyalty. 
These comments, questioning the loyalty of American Jews to America, were condemned by Jewish American groups, who accused Trump of invoking anti-Semitic stereotypes. Again, Mr. Trump, you will recall, told Jewish Republicans in 2015, quote, you're not going to support me because I don't want your money. And then, following a march by neo-Nazis and white supremacists in Charlottesville, Virginia in 2017, in a counter-protest, he declared, quote, there were very fine people on both sides. As the recent nationwide upsurge in anti-Semitic incidents and the mass murders at synagogues demonstrate, anti-Semitism in America, which is part of white supremacy, is deadly serious. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU, because freedom can't protect itself. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. Today in Labor History, we pause to remember the events that took place on the morning of September 11th. The year was 2001. Terrorists hijacked planes and intentionally crashed them into the Twin Towers in New York City and the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. Nearly 3,000 people were killed in the attack, including 634 union members. They were members of the fire and police unions that had responded to help those at the scene of the attack. They were also pilots and flight attendants on the crashed planes. 343 firefighters died on that day. It was the deadliest firefighter disaster in U.S. history. Before September 11th, the greatest loss of firefighters in an urban building collapse fire occurred in Chicago in 1910. 21 firefighters were killed while fighting a fire in the stockyards. 11 years after the September 11th attack, Harold Schattenberger of the International Association of Firefighters recalled their sacrifice. At the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, our members gave everything they had. The best that this union and this nation have to offer was demonstrated in their courageous response. In the aftermath of September 11th, the Firefighters Union worked to improve benefits and protections for their members and their families. In particular, the Uniformed Firefighters Association Local 94 and Uniformed Fire Officers Association Local 854 lobbied Washington officials on these issues. In 2010, President Barack Obama signed the James Zagroda 9-11 Health and Compensation Act into law. The act was named after a police officer who developed a fatal respiratory disease while working at recovery efforts at Ground Zero. The act provided medical monitoring and treatment to World Trade Center responders. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and the Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com. Thank you for accompanying us here to the Chef's Table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. We always begin weather from around the world, along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 58 degrees Fahrenheit, slated for a high in the low 80s. Uh, Partly cloudy conditions should prevail through out the day, winds will be light and variable all day and into the night, where we will be experiencing lows in the mid to upper 50s, clear skies, and sunny skies tomorrow with a high of 91. Winds will be increasing out of the north-northeast at 5 to 10 miles per hour. And then as we get closer to the weekend, we have increasing possibilities of rain And uh, starting uh, late Saturday and through Sunday, expecting at least a quarter inch of rain. And then uh, about uh, about, something less than that on Monday and Tuesday of next week. But we'll see because that's still quite a bit of time between then and now. Ragweed pollen is the pollen rated right now, and it is low. The air quality index is rated good at 22 parts per million, and the daytime UV index is high at 6. Barometric pressure locally is holding steady at 30.14 inches. Visibility is at 9 miles, and relative humidity is at 88%. 
Weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property, and these people positively live around the world. London is 68 and cloudy with a high possibility of Boris Johnson being uh, convicted for lying to the Queen. Uh, Paris is 77 and fair. Rome is 86 and fair. Kiev is 81 and fair. Kabul is 78 and fair. Well, it's been fair all over the world so far. And let's see. Oh, Hong Kong is 82 and clear. Tokyo is 81 degrees and partly cloudy, and they still have a typhoon warning. Sydney, Australia is... uh, Oh, I should back up here. Tokyo is not only in a typhoon warning. They've been hit by a typhoon. Sydney, Australia is 55 and clear. San Francisco is 56 and fair. And New York, New York is 76 degrees Fahrenheit and fair. And that is weather from around the world brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world. Anonymous worker bees at Reuters bring us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Japanese utility Tokyo Electric Power said it will not be able to restore electricity to all the homes lacking power after Typhoon Fexe and until Friday or later, with media saying at least two people had died because they had no power. The typhoon hit the capital and surrounding regions with destructive winds of up to 134 miles per hour in the early hours of Monday, causing at least one death, damage, transport chaos, and power outages. National broadcaster NHK said two people in the prefecture of Chiba, east of Tokyo, died of heat stroke. One woman in her 90s, due to a lack of power for air conditioning, as temperatures rose sharply after the typhoon. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière. La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles Rester toujours fidèle C'est tout C'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps Mes étés de mer Mes automnes Quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire, je te donne tous mes hivers. Patricia Zangurley of Reuters brings us this final amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Republican and Democratic senators said they expected the U.S. Congress would pass legislation restoring $250 million in military aid for the Ukraine if Trump goes ahead with his plans to block the assistance. If he decides not to spend this money, I truly am fairly confident that on a bipartisan basis, Congress will reappropriate it, Republican Senator Ron Johnson told reporters. Johnson made his remarks at a news conference with Democratic Senator Chris Murphy about their recent trip to Europe, which included stops in Ukraine, Kosovo, and Serbia. Murphy also visited Russia. The two lawmakers had requested visas to visit Russia but Vlad denied their request alright that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day but you do know that Netroots Radio is going to broadcast on in fact we're going to meet up tomorrow for Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays so do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks and we'll meet up here tomorrow right here 
in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TR, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver